Um, so I want to talk about um, exception handling in functional and reactive programming. Uh, this is a topic that um, I, I decided to talk about because this is a very often asked question from developers. Uh, oftentimes when I talk about functional programming or when I uh, you know, discuss about various things related to uh, programming, this question comes up a lot. So I decided this will, this will be a really good, good topic to really dive into. Uh, but before we go into it, I want to set the expectations. Uh, there are no good answers. Uh, that's not a bad thing because you might be the one who comes up with a good answer. So take that as an opportunity more than anything else. And uh, so let's talk a little bit about functional programming, uh, just a little bit about uh, you know, lazy evaluation reactive programming. Then we'll dive into this concept and dive, you know, discuss these things. Uh, functional programming has been around for a very long time, but a lot of mainstream languages today support functional programming. And so we can definitely you know, enjoy and benefit from it. So what is really about functional programming? You could say the first and foremost is when it comes to programming an imperative style, we have what is called accidental complexity. Accidental complexity comes from the solution we choose, whereas inherent complexity comes from the problem itself that we are implementing. Your tax software or your you know, banking application or a reservation system, all of them have complexities associated with the domain. Those are inherent complexities. Accidental complexity often is predominant in imperative style of programming, but thankfully, uh, functional programming reduces that complexity. That's one of the real big benefits we can you know, think about. So for example, let's say we are you know, having numbers is equal to, let's say, a list of numbers. Let's just start with a few numbers in here. And I want to work with, let's say, these numbers in here. So here's an example of a functional style of programming. So we could say numbers.stream, and, and writing this code in Java, we could say, for example, uh, a filter, and, and in the filter we could do, for example, a given a, a element, we could say, uh, you know, is even, and we could only pick even numbers, if you will. Then, of course, we could say, for instance, we could do a map, and given an element, we can call a double it and double the value, and then finally for each, and we can do a system, let's say, uh, dot out and, and print line, and we could uh, print it out. So the is even is going to be a function we want to create. So let's go ahead and say, in this case, we have a public, let's say, uh, a Boolean function. We'll call it is even, which is taking a number and is simply going to return that number uh, back to us. Uh, if it's even, it's going to tell us it's true. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, false. So similarly, we'll go ahead and write uh, maybe a one more function in this case. We'll go ahead and say this is going to be a doublet function which is going to take a number, obviously, but return, let's say, a number times two. So this is a very, fairly simple example of code, but what if I really wanted to do a find first in here? So I'm only interested in the very first value in this particular uh, collection, and, and I want to be able to print that value, so you could do something along these lines. We'll come back to that in a little bit later and look at it. So essentially, in this case, the essence of this is we have a functional, you could say, a pipeline. So or, or you could say this is really a, a pipeline of functions. That's another way to really look at it. So we have a pipeline of functions, and, and we are drawing on that transformation of data through that functional pipeline. So that's one of the key strengths of this. But the real beauty of this is the code begins to read like the problem statement. So you can say, given the numbers, give me the even numbers, give me the double of those, and print it. So it's very logical flow through the code, very limited complexity you have to deal with compared to the imperative style of programming we often work with. So this gives us the functional pipeline and the functional composition. However, when you look at a code like this, we can definitely say, wow, that's amazing, it's cute, it's easy to understand, it's elegant, but unfortunately, cuteness and elegant will not sustain. We can look at a code that's nice and cute and elegant, but the question we're going to ask is, what about performance? And if a code doesn't perform really well, we are going to move on to other things. So that's one of the key things about functional programming is, functional programming uses lazy evaluation to really give that performance. So in other words, a code is not evaluated 
unless that code is really necessary for the result. So in order to emphasize that in here, if I say find the first right there, and if I ask for the very first element to be printed out, now naively speaking, we could say we are taking every single element in this collection and determining if it's an even number. Well, that would be six operations in this case, logically speaking. Then, of course, we double all the even numbers. That's three more operations because there are three even numbers. So six plus three, nine operations later, we discard everything and just use one result. That's going to be pretty darn inefficient. Well, thankfully, functional programming doesn't do it. This is what I use as a differentiation between functional style of programming and functional programming. Functional style focuses on the elegance and the reduced complexity. Functional programming goes further to think about the reduced uh, you know, uh, evaluation or, or lazy evaluation as well. So in here, I'm going to simply say, e is e, let's say E is even called far, and I'm going to say number right like so, and similarly, we'll say a doublet is called for that particular number. When I run this code, though, notice that it called the E's even for two values. It called the double uh, value, double for uh, uh, one value, and then it quit, and it did not really touch even the values of three, four, five, and six in this particular case. Well, that's because of lazy evaluation. So lazy evaluation cuts down on computation which otherwise would have to take place, and so the code becomes really efficient. So take away, so oftentimes I say that lazy evaluation, if you will, evaluation is to functional programming as, you could say polymorphism, uh, polymorphism uh, is to object-oriented programming. So without polymorphism, there is no object-oriented programming. You're using objects and classes, but the power of extensibility comes from polymorphism. In a similar way, you could play with functions all you want, but the real benefit comes in because of lazy evaluation, and without lazy evaluation, there's not a whole lot of functional programming to really talk about. So, so let's leave the thought aside for a second. So we have reduced complexity, easier to understand code, a better way of writing code, good performance because of lazy evaluation as well, but then we have another concept that's getting really prevalent, which is reactive programming. And when I started digging into reactive programming, I got really frustrated because a lot of material was talking about how awesome this is and what the principles are, but I'm the person who says, show me the code, because I really want to understand how things work in the code, and call me silly, but this was like a light bulb moment in my head, and one day I realized that reactive programming is really functional programming plus plus. So essentially, in this case, we are really taking the ideas of uh, you know, functional programming, but we are extending on that when it comes to reactive programming. So for example, let's take this code that's in here, let's just leave it at that for a second, and, and for a minute, let's go ahead and you know, remove those print statements as well. We'll come back to those a little bit later. You can see the result is a four, that's what we got right there. But what I'm going to do, though, is to mix this with a reactive API. So let's say io.reactivex.star. Let's go ahead and start with maybe a flowable, and we can say from iterable. And I'm going to start, in this case, with the numbers collection that we have. So I'm bringing in the reactive library right in here. So basically, in this case, io.reactivex. So let's say in this case, I have reactive x, reactive dot uh, star. So basically, I want to bring in the uh, code for, uh, let's see what's going on here. Looks like I messed up with my uh, you know, a path in here. But essentially, we want to bring in the reactive library. I want to bring in the flowable API, right? So that's what I want to say. So the flowable, which is really uh, a part of the Rx Java API, which is really a, a nice little API, so reactive, let's say, uh, um, uh, Rx Java. So Rx Java is, is one of the reactive APIs, if you will. So you can say io.reactivex. That's what I was trying to do. So basically, in this case, you have a flowable that you can say from the uh, iterator. But once you get the iterator going from the flowable, 
you can pretty much write the same functional pipeline that you are used to uh, bringing in, if you will, uh, quite naturally, if you will, uh, in, in general. So essentially in this case, yeah, it looks like I messed up something on my path on my system, but anyway, how, does, how would this code look like in this particular case? Well, you would say from iterable, but literally you would do a filter, and this is gonna be uh, ease even, and you are gonna use almost the same set of methods, like so a map here as well, and you would say double it, and you would double the value, except here you can say subscribe, and in this case, you can say system.out and a print line, and you can print the value like so. So when you look at this code, it's got a lot of similarities between the two in terms of how you would iterate through the collection of data, whereas you are using the Java 8 stream here, you could use a reactive stream to pull the data and use that in here, but once you get the reactive stream, it's exactly the same filter and, and the map operations you perform. But in the very last step, as you can see, you are calling a subscribe here rather than using a for each in this particular case to run through it. So that shows you an idea about how they are very similar to each other. So the reactive library raises the level of abstraction from the functional programming. So what that really means is when you program reactively, you also enjoy the lazy evaluation that you're used to in functional programming. So that's one of the reasons why I often say that a reactive API is really uh, pretty much the functional programming with the higher level of abstraction uh, built on top of it. So then the question is, of course, why not just be happy with functional style? Maybe that's what we should all do, and maybe we should quit programming in imperative style. Well, this is where it becomes really troubling when we start really favoring one way of doing things uh, so adamantly that we lose sight of there is a balance to strike almost all the time. So there are times when imperative style of programming is you know, more complex, we can agree to it. It's got accidental complexity built into it. So maybe functional style is awesome because the reduced complexity makes it easier to understand the code, easier to change it, easier to parallelize it, so maybe that's what we should be doing. Well, that's almost true until, of course, we come down to talking about exceptions. So exception handling, let's rethink about this for a little bit before we go into the functional style again and talk about it. Now, some of you may be programming for a very long time, and you probably remember the time when functions would return a negative number when there is an error. So we would call a function, and if everything is great, that's fine. If something were to go wrong, a minus one would mean, mean an error condition, a minus two would mean something else. We did that for a while. Then we realized, wait, that's not really a nice way to communicate an error. It doesn't force people to check the errors. It really limits what we can propagate using error code. We gotta look up somewhere what this error code mean contextually, that was not very elegant. So then we said, well, here's an idea. Let's really come up with some error codes we can return. And then, of course, what about the result of the function? Well, we then started passing references to variables to function as argument. The functions would then populate those references for the return data and use the return itself as a purely an error code. Some of you may remember back in time COM and CORBA APIs. Uh, in, in the case of COM, an SOK would mean everything is good, or you would get an error code, and H result you have to deal with, horrible days. Uh, but anyway, that's how we communicated error versus data. That was really unwieldy. But in short, I would say, we still don't have a clue how to handle errors. So it's, it's, if, if we have a foregone conclusion that we have come up with a good idea to handle exception, rather errors, I would say that's pretty naive. We, the world has settled upon exception handling right now. And I'm really hoping maybe in the next 10 years and 15 years, we'll find a better way to handle it. I, will, I, I always think of this time, maybe 500 years from now, a group of young programmers sitting and, and coding, and they then pause to laugh 
back at us and say, these people are really dealing with exception this way, how weird it is. Much like how we look at, you know, how people did in the past about certain things, and we are like, gosh, they really didn't get this right, isn't it? So I still have a feeling we don't have a handle on exception handling. However, I can definitely say one thing though, and that is, you can say exception handling is fundamentally uh, an imperative style of uh, style of programming uh, programming idea. So essentially, in this particular case, when it comes to exception handling, it's fundamentally an uh, imperative style of programming idea. But to make things worse, I would say uh, functional uh, programming uh, and uh, exception handling uh, exception handling you can definitely say. Uh, are mutually exclusive. So I want to go to the extent of saying, no, don't use them together. It's actually a really a terrible idea to really bring them together. So, so it's not that it doesn't you know, really fit very well. It actually is supposed to not be mixed together. I was reading about this the other day. They were saying that uh, a person uh, decided to smoke while sitting in the back of a truck. I don't have a problem with that. I'm not going to judge people. Smoking is somebody's right. If they want to smoke, that's perfectly fine. I also read about the person who wanted to carry gasoline in the back of a truck. I think that's fairly reasonable as well. The problem is it was the same person and it did not end up very well, unfortunately. That's kind of what we are talking about here. You want to do exceptions? I have no problem with it. You want to deal with functional programming? I have no problem with it. Bring them together is not going to end very well. So let's talk a little bit more about this with a bit of a concrete example to see why this might be really a problem. So let's start with, let's say airport names as a function here. So right here is a function that says, hey, I'm going to take a name of a code of an airport, an IATA code, and I'm going to go to this URL and present the code for that particular airport. And if there's something wrong with that particular code, it's gonna blow up with a invalid airport code and tells me that something was wrong with it. And then of course, otherwise, I'm gonna get the name of the airport. Again, I'm gonna be absolutely uh, you know, impatient with this. I'm not gonna do the right things. I'm just gonna randomly go access that particular data and return back to you. Now, how do I go about using this? So I'm gonna say, get airport, uh, you know, name of airport, let's say ATL for a minute, and then execute that code uh, to see what it wants to tell us. So let's go ahead and bring in Java dot, let's say IO dot, um, in this particular case, I wanna bring in the net, right? So we wanna bring in the Java dot net dot URL, which we're gonna be using at this particular point, uh, and of course, Java dot IO as well. So let's bring in the imports necessary and, and let's see what it wants to tell us. All right, it says you need to really handle the exception. Fine, I'm gonna put a little try uh, block around it. I'm gonna put a little catch right here. And let's say this is the IO exception or simply an exception, let's go ahead and say. And I, all I wanna do is to simply print out the exception. Let's say get message and print it. So we'll keep it rather very simple right now. So when I execute this code, it gives us the name of the airport. So hey, that's great, it worked. It gave us the name of the airport. That seems like it's doing the job. But let's try this a little bit further here. So we have a um, list of airports given to us. And in this particular case, I want to say, let's iterate over these and print the names of the airports. So we can say a far. And in this particular case, let me just go ahead and delete all of this for a second. So we'll say a far, let's say a string. This is going to be IA. TA code that comes from the IATA codes as we know. And I'm gonna simply say, let's take the IATA code that's given to us and ask for the airport for the given IATA uh, code that we have at our hands. Now clearly the compiler is gonna tell us we need to handle the exception so it fails compilation. So what do I do in this particular case? Well, here's an idea. I can put a try block again right there in this code, and I can then say right in here, uh, let's go ahead and print the exception if something were to go wrong. So we'll say catch exception ex, 
And let's output the message over here and we'll say get message. Now, there are a couple of different things happening in this particular case, but when I run this code, you can see it tells us Austin and Houston and Dallas, Fort Worth and San Antonio, and you can see that it's fetching the data. I'm going through my cell phone service here, so it's probably a little slow to get the data, but eventually it's going to give us all those data for those different uh, you know, uh, 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 airports. So, so that's San Antonio right there, but the other ones it's got to go through and give the data for us as well and, and print those out. So essentially in this particular case, it seems to be doing what it's supposed to do, but that's an imperative style of code as we know uh, pretty well. But what if something were to go wrong? Now, before we go into that particular concept here, I'm not sure why it prints only the last one, but it should be printing all the, all the airport codes. We'll, we'll run this here on the command line so we can take, oh, there you go, finally, once I complain it, it's working. So right there, you can see that it printed the data for all those different airports. But Java is probably the only language on the JVM and maybe elsewhere where we deal with what are called the checked exceptions. Uh, I personally think Checked exceptions are a terrible idea, but that's what Java did. Almost any language other than Java on the JVM collectively got together and said, you know, forget about checked exception, we'll treat all exceptions as unchecked. The only difference between checked exception and unchecked exception is not the runtime behavior, but the compile time behavior. If you are throwing a checked exception, the Java compiler insists you better catch it or you declare it as throws, Whereas if it's an unchecked exception, it doesn't force you to declare it or to you know, define as throws. But at one time, the behavior is no different. Either you catch it or the exception bubbles up, whether it's a checked exception or unchecked exception, it doesn't matter. Now, in this particular case, if I were to go back to this code, and what if I, for whatever reason, I have an airport code that is invalid? Now, in all fairness, you may say, well, if it's an invalid airport, why do you bother putting it? Well, the point is, the world changes around us. I remember one application where we had uh, you know, stock tickers we were using, and everything went fine for years on end, and suddenly the application you know, one day notified to us saying, this stock ticker symbol doesn't exist anymore. Well, apparently the company decided to go, uh, you know, not be public anymore. That happens occasionally, not too often, so something that may have been a valid data once upon a time may not be valid anymore. Airports change their names, maybe potentially you know, they change the code, who knows what's gonna happen. So the idea here is, what's gonna happen if a airport code is invalid? So when you look at this particular uh, application in this case, if the airport code is invalid, it nicely, gracefully tells us so. It says invalid airport code TAS, and tells us that's not a valid airport code. So great so far. Now before we go any further, one of the tenets I would like to follow is the behavior of an application should be independent of the implementation of the application. You cannot go to your customers and say, hey look, we believe in functional programming, so we're gonna rewrite the code in functional style, but when we are done, you'll get completely different results, hope you're okay with it. That's not gonna buy customers for us, right? So the customers, the users don't care whether you're using imperative style or functional style of programming, output has to be the same when everything is said and done. Now, how do I convert this code from uh, imperative style to a functional style of programming? Well, first of all, if I were to be you know, straightforward in how to convert it, you would simply say, here are IATA codes, and you can say dot stream, and you can do a for each, and you can do a system dot out print line. We'll take baby steps as we work towards it. So this is iterating in a functional pipeline and printing the code. That's all it's doing right now. So that's pretty straightforward and trivial to convert an iteration of airport codes from functional imperative style to a functional style. No big deal, isn't it? Now, of course, I'm going to say a map, and I'm going to say a string a to uppercase. Maybe I want to even convert to an uppercase and print the airport names in uppercase. Again, that's really easy, not a problem. But the next step here, though, is to map and say, given a code, I want to call the get 
airport names uh, in here and pass the code to it. So now, when I write this code, we are saying given the day, uh, airport codes, for each airport code, call the function to get the name of the airport. Once the name of the airport is given, convert it to uppercase and print it. That is amazingly simple, easy to understand, no accidental complexity in the code, so definitely something we could celebrate except for one little problem. When you run this code, it gives you a compilation error. The error says unreported exception, IO exception, must be caught or declared to be thrown. So either you catch it or you say you want to throw it. So you may look at this and say, huh, I really don't care about exception right now, so I'm going to say throws IO exception. So or maybe even exception because I don't care to be very specific. But when you make the change and you compile the code, the compiler gives you exactly the same error like nothing ever happened. Total lack of empathy, right? It could have at least told you, dear programmer, thanks for trying. And then say the damn error again. But instead it just repeats the whole thing again and you look at this and say, what in the world, right? Well, as it turns out in this case, putting that there made absolutely no difference. So what's happening in this particular case? Well, as it turns out, what's happening is the function it's complaining is not the main function. The function it's complaining is the lambda expression. So that lambda expression that's highlighted, it says, either that needs to handle the exception or you have to declare it as throws. Now, obviously, you can put a throws anywhere over there. So what do you do to handle it? Well, let's pause here for a second and think about one problem in here. Why do we even say that exception? Well, let's see that exception or, or the error. Well, if you look at the map function, does anyone remember what's the parameter for the map? What is the parameter type for the map? What do you pass to map? That's right, a function. And what's the abstract method of function? Bingo, apply. And what's the signature of apply? The signature of apply is R apply T, and you have an input that you're passing with a little semicolon at the end. What is missing here? No exceptions. So fundamentally, the functional APIs of Java don't deal with exceptions, specifically checked exceptions. So when you look at map, when you look at filter, when you look at almost any method in the functional pipeline, it doesn't have anything to do with exceptions. Now, when you look at this fact and say, oh my goodness, they don't have anything to do with exceptions, but maybe if apply, oh, here's an interesting thought to think about, right? I'm always curious about these things. You remember the good old callable uh, API, right? What does callable have a method called call, isn't it? And what does it return, by the way? Some callable T returns a T, isn't it, right? Now, Java has a supplier, and guess what a supplier has? A get function. Now, you look at this and say, wait a minute, why have supplier when there is callable? Any guess? What's one difference between the call of callable and the get of supplier? That's right, it throws an exception, potentially. So now we're heading somewhere, right? They took the time to rewrite callable without an exception. Otherwise, they could have just used callable. Why did they create a supplier, right? Now, what's funny here is none of the methods of the functional interfaces throw an exception. Now, this would be really funny if this was not true. But I got an email from somebody, literally, I saved this email, and this is what the email said. Hey, Venkat, none of the functions in the stream API related functional interface deal with exceptions. And I got really upset about it, so I forked the JDK and changed all the interfaces. Now they throw exception. And here's the code 
can you do a code review for me? And I replied to the person saying, I'll be happy to do code review, but you need to do one more thing for me before I do it. Can you tell me? Because if you can fork it and change it so quickly, I think they can do it much faster than you do. So can you tell me why they did not bother to have those classes? If you can answer the why question, then we can look at the how you did this. And that's the most important question we need to ask. Were they really silly? Did they overlook it? Or were they intentional? So this really goes back to what I said earlier. Functional programming and exception handling are mutually exclusive. So it was a very deliberate effort. They did not bring exceptions into it. This is why even though Callable throws an exception, they have a supplier which doesn't because they never want to bring the one that throws exception into the mix. So we're stuck at this code. What do we do? Well, here's an idea that some people have tried. They look at this code and say, aha, the compiler tells me I got to either to handle the exception or I have to throw it. The first thing they get angry at is checked exceptions. Now, compiler is your enemy because it complains and the compiler is between you and running this code. So what can you do to get the compiler out of the way? So then they come up with this beautiful idea. They put a nice little curly brace and then they go in here, put another curly brace right there, right? And then you say in here, this is gonna be a return of that response. Then we say a try right there and a catch. And in this case, it's the IO exception or, or is it the IO exception? What is this returning? Let's take a look, yeah. It's the IO exception, right? So we can say, here comes the try block and let's go ahead and say a curly brace and then we say a catch. Uh, IO exception EX, and then they say throws new runtime exception. And then you wrap that into a runtime exception, and then the compiler now is quiet. Now, what did we do? We silenced the one thing that was trying us to tell, think, right? <laughs> and, and we said, you shut up. And, and the compiler was like, okay, I hope you know what you're doing. Now, this, by the way, I call it as curl up in a corner and cry pattern. Because every time I look at this code, I curl up in a corner, cry for a little bit, wipe my tears, and come back and refactor the code. This is terrible. And so many people do this without even thinking. Why? Because they are like, compiler, I know how to fix you, right? And we silence the compiler, wrapping the checked exception to an unchecked exception. Now, what just happened? You run the code, and they will say, the code is working. I quit using the word code works a while ago. These days, I only say the code behaves, right? It is doing something. I don't know if that's the right thing or not. So if you go back to this code now, and if you say, in this case, PAS, and run the code, what's going to happen right now? You notice, in this case, you got the code blowing up with a runtime exception right in the middle of execution. When it hits the TAS, it's going to fail. So as a result, it's going to blow up the whole stack. What about the airport for San Antonio? What's going to happen for that is the question. Well, as it turns out, it never gets to that point, as you can see. So you got a pile of stack trays in front of you. But notice on the bottom, you don't see San Antonio. This only becomes more interesting, let's say, if you turn this into a parallel stream, now what's going to happen? Who knows, right? <laughs> so when you run the code, it's going to blow up in some place over here and there, and the results can be really unpredictable. Now the good news says you can give this to your user and say, but this is better, because you're using <laughs> functional programming, right? Well, but the code is not doing the same thing anymore. What gives? So essentially, this is completely a different behavior. So what just happened? Now, you can take this idea and you can polish this even further, but something that shouldn't be polished. And that is to say, hey, here is an idea. This code is smelly. That's really a lot of code to write. Maybe we should think of a better way to write this code. 
So people have tried other approaches, if you will. So again, the code doesn't compile anymore. So what you could do is you could think about how you can deal with it, and you can try to convert this into a functional style by creating a wrapper function. Let's entertain this thought just for a minute. So you could say here, a function t comma r has a convert to runtime exception, which takes a functional, a function ex, where a function ex can throw an exception. So what this function will do is to take a function ex, one that can throw an exception, and wrap it with a, a result of a function. So you could say, for example, in this case, return input, you could say, and in this case, you can return a function. So obviously, you take an input, you return an output. Within this, you can put a try block like so, and a catch, of course, as you would expect. And then within the catch block, you could say, you know, throw new runtime exception like we did before a few minutes ago. And then you could say, in this case, uh, exception, you can wrap it as an exception like so. And then, of course, you can make the call to the function within here, uh, like, for example, func.apply, and you can pass the data that's given to you, and you can return the response from it. So the benefit of this is everywhere you call this code, you wouldn't be writing that code, and instead you could say convert to runtime exception, something like this. This is not any better than what we did, except that it's not you know, ugly at the, at the site, but it has the same problems as the other piece of code, so it's no better. It's probably even worse because at least the other one was smelly. You would you know, refactor. This is real nice and dangerous, if you will, so that's really a terrible piece of code. So fundamentally, the question to ask is, what's going on here? Well, as it turns out, um, it can get, like I said, with parallel, so what do we do, what gives? Well, as you can see, different people have tried different solutions along the way, and this is a very common approach uh, people have tried, so I decided to post this tweet last year, and for this Halloween, I've chosen a costume of exceptions with functional style of programming. That can be a really scary thing to do, because I've seen this in code, and it's a great way to really scare the, the kids. So that's really not a good solution. We don't want to be writing code like that. So what can we do to make this better? But let's rethink about the problem just for a minute. Now, here is where I was a little bit surprised because oftentimes I give an example from the real life into programming as an analogy. So I would be talking about you know, programming. I would say, let's think about and give something from the real world that's easy to think about and, and relate to. I never thought I would use a programming as an analogy into a real life. This is like nature in reverse. But this happened right in beginning of you know, 2020, just a few months before we all shut down and stayed home. I was actually speaking in the Boston Java user group, and amazing group, had a great time, and just like today, right, running into the evening, and I finished my talk, you know, had dinner with the group, and finally about 10 o'clock in the night, I said, probably good idea to go check into a hotel. I've got an early morning flight to Montreal. And I said to myself, Montreal is just a neighboring country. I'm an international traveler. I don't need to really go to the airport ahead of time. That's fine. I'll just, you know, leave at 4 o'clock. The flight is at 6.30. I'll be just fine. So I wake up early, start driving to the airport at 4 o'clock, it had snowed that night, so the entire streets were filled with snow, and I was the only idiot on the road at that time. And as I was driving over to the airport, I heard a little noise, and things quite didn't go well with the car after that. So I parked the car right in the middle of the road. There's nobody. I get down, and the front right, right tire busted. Uh, it's completely flat. So I'm sitting in the middle of a road with the, with the, on the way to the airport about 4.15 in the morning, my flight is at 6.30, I'm thinking, what do I do? And I can't even call for help anybody because anybody I know is sleeping, so what can I do? And I called the, you know, uh, the rental car company, and their voicemail said, your call is important to us, which really means you are going to get no help anytime soon. And then they said, we'll be with you in about two and a half hours. I said, no, that's not going to work. My flight is going to be gone by the time 
I've got a talk to give at you know, uh, nine o'clock in the morning in Montreal. I definitely want to be there. I don't have the you know, luxury of waiting for this tow truck to come in uh, to help me in two and a half hours. And I was just sitting there absolutely clueless what to do. And I'm not kidding with you, this exact thing came to my mind. And I said to myself, how do I deal with exception in functional programming? And the answer was very clear in my mind. And the answer I often give is deal. Uh, so first of all, I say treat uh, error as data uh, and deal with it downstream. And I said this to me about three times and it gave me new courage. I turned on the ignition, put my foot to the pedal and I drove all the way to the airport. And as I dragged in, there was this huge noise rolling in right now. And the few people working early in the morning came close to me and said, are you okay? And I said, oh, it's just a flat tire. Here's the key, by the way. Thank you, bye. And I just rushed to the gate. I boarded my flight, gave the talk, everything went fine. And a few weeks later, my wife called me up one of my trips and said, oh, by the way, remember you said this problem you had in Boston? I'm like, uh-huh, yes, of course. And she said, I got the bill. I said, oh, let me sit down. And then she said, oh, they charge you $65. I can handle that. So essentially, the whole idea is deal with it downstream. So the point here is you don't have the luxury. Here's a way to think about it. Imagine a good friend of yours calls you frantically and says, hey, I'm on the freeway. I'm on the central lane. I have a flat tire. What do I do? What's the worst advice you will ever give this friend if especially don't want this person as a friend anymore in your life? You would tell them, you have a flat tire in the middle of the freeway, put the car in reverse and drive back where you came from. That's not a good advice you would give. So what would you instead tell them? You would tell them, be careful, safety is important, keep driving forward and exit to the shoulder and pull over away from the traffic. Well, that's exactly what you want to do, is you never want to go back in reverse. Now think about what happens when you do exceptions. You are calling a function which calls a function which calls a function. That function blows up literally. Now you are rolling back the call stack. That clearly is an imperative style of programming approach. In functional programming, you have the functional pipeline. Your data is flowing through the pipeline one stage at a time. When you're in the middle of a pipeline, if you have an exception, if you blow up, where do you go? It makes no sense to blow up a pipeline when something goes wrong. So the idea is treat error as data and deal with it downstream. So let's think about this a little bit further to see how we could possibly do this. Now, this is where things get a little bit more complex and we want to really rethink about how you would handle it. So the question is, how do functional programming really handle this? Well, we can think about languages like Haskell, because languages like Haskell are purely functional programming languages, and Scala for, for one was heavily in, you know, inspired by Haskell. So how does Scala handle a situation like this? Let's think about this a little bit more to see this. So here is airport names function. This is obviously a Java function. That's not going to cut it, but let's go ahead and try to take this code really quickly here and say define get name of airport, and here is a IAPA code. But remember, most languages don't care about checked exceptions. So I don't care about the throws IO. That doesn't mean anything uh, for languages like Scala because we don't care about checked exceptions. So what I'm going to do here though is I'm going to say here is a URL. I'm going to bring in, and this URL is going to be for the IAPA code that we have right there. So let's go ahead and wrap that into a little dollar so we got the nice URL on our hand. I don't care about the try either because that doesn't bias anything. So here is a scanner I'm going to create with the stream as you can see right there. Then I'm going to say here is a response I want to get from that particular line. And then of course, if the response contains the name, that's great. If not, I want to simply throw the exception that we have in there, and we will say here's an invalid airport code, and we're going to throw that. If everything else is fine, 
I'm going to say response, and we're going to split that right there, and I'm going to use the array to get the data for that, and I'm going to return that to the caller, so that becomes my function here in the case of Scala. So let's see if this actually works before we go any further. So here in the main, I want to simply go ahead and print out, let's say, get name of airport, just like we did earlier. Let's go ahead and say ATL and see what the compiler wants to tell us. Well, URL is needed, obviously, in this case. The scanner is needed as well. So let's say import, let's say, java.util.star, and we'll also bring in the java.net as well uh, in here as well. So we'll bring those two uh, references in this particular code. So this is basically the Scala code that goes out and gets the uh, data for the airport. Well, that's great so far, but what if I were to create a collection of these airports on the other hand? So back here, let's get rid of the TAS for a second again and simply say I want the data for these airports. So I'm going to say this is the uh, IATA code and we will say this is going to be a list uh, essentially of those airports. Well, now that we have the list of airports, what do I want to do? Let's go back to this code and say, hey, I want to start with the airport code. So IATA codes, let's start with. And we can say uh, for each of those, we will go ahead and just simply say uh, print it. And we'll simply, uh, you know, print line, we'll ask it to print the value out for those, those codes, if you will. So basically, in this case, we are just iterating through the airport. We'll go ahead and say, you know, given a code, we'll say if this is going to be the value we're going to get. So we'll say a print line, and we will ask it to print that particular value in this particular case through the collection. Let's see what it's telling us in here. So I've got, oh, of course, <laughs> got to be careful here. So this is going to be the scanner because it was confusing between Java list and the Scala list right there. So that was the problem in there. And of course, I'm going to say this is going to be the print line. I want to simply go ahead and print it, whatever value that we are receiving in this particular case. Let's see what that error says. It's a different error it's moved on to. Let's take a look at it. So it's complaining to me, it's not a member of the list. Did you mean a uh, patch? No, I did not mean that. So basically, in this case, we want to take these values and we want to print those values. That's what we are trying to do. So right there is the code we are printing. Great. I want to take that again. And in this case, I want to perform a map operation. And let's simply say in here, let's say to uppercase, and we'll ask it to convert to a, a uppercase like so and we'll ask it to uh, print it out. So this is simply saying, print those, they were already in uppercase, but print them in uppercase, you can ask it to print it in uppercase. So this is simply asking us to uh, print the values, I can never remember this, is it a lowercase or an uppercase for uppercase, we'll find out. So essentially I'm asking to print it in uppercase for those particular values, like so, right? So we're just taking the string and converting it and printing it. Oh, okay, so far. Now, of course, I say dot map, but here comes the interesting part. We take a code and we're going to call the get name of airport and call the code like so uh, to convert it to using a map. So this is all the happy path as you can see. It's going to go through the each of the airport, get the code and print it. Now again, because Scala doesn't care about checked exceptions, it's not complaining to us right in here. So we are going through the each of the airports and getting the data and then we are printing it out and you saw the output appear just there. So far, so good. But what's going to happen if this has an error? So like a TAS. Well, when I run the code, remember, exception handling and functional style don't go together. It's mutually exclusive. So when you look at the output of this code, that's a scary output that you're going to see from this when the exception happens for TAS. So it blew up. It didn't give us any results at all. So clearly not what we wanted. So what do we do to deal with this? Well, so the first thing is uh, treat uh, error as a form of data. So you're saying, I'm going to take the error that comes in, but I'm going to wrap that error and treat it like it's a data and send it down the pipeline. Well, if you're going to send it through the pipeline, what's going to happen in this case? The error starts here. You're going to wrap the error into an object Think of this like a union object, where the union object may have either the data or the error. 
you send that down to the next level, what does that do? It now says, if it's a data, I will transform that to an uppercase. If it's an error, I'll simply move it down the chain. So now, every level needs to deal with this union object. If it's a data, we deal with it. If it's an error, we push it down the chain so we can receive it at the other side. So how do we really make this happen? Well, first of all, in order to abstract it out, uh, Scala has a type called a try type. You probably have used this if you use libraries like Waver, because those libraries in Java really took the idea from Scala and implemented on the Java side. So try is a trait, an interface at a very top level. So the try interface or try trait simply says, I represent a union object, either a success or a failure. Success extends from try. It's a derived object. So it extends from try and success is a carrier of data. Failure also extends from try, but it's a carrier of failure or an error rather than data. So you have these two. So try is the abstraction at the top and your success or failure are really the different types that you have in this particular case. So now what can I do? I can abstract the call to return a try, if you will. So I could do the following. I can simply say, I want to call a function, try to get airport name, which returns a try, get name of airport data. This is a pretty nice little function call. So what this function call does is it says, if this function returns a data, return a success, which is also a try. If this function blows up with an exception, then don't return a success, but instead return a failure. So this function literally will return either a success or a failure, depending on what happened. Let's just play with that alone just for a minute to get a feel for it before we go. Obviously, I need to put this in the Scala side, not in the Java side. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that on the other side. So we'll do that in just a second. So I'm gonna close this file, so let's go back here. So I wanna go ahead and write that function right there. So we'll just write that right here, if you will. So that's a function we wrote. But let's give it a try. So what am I gonna do here? I'm gonna simply say print line, and we'll say try to get the airport data for, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, SAT, and what is that going to return uh, back to us? Let's go ahead and remove these for a few minutes. We'll come back and talk about that once that uh, code works. So we'll come back and take a look at it a little bit later. So now when I run the code, what do you see here uh, in, in the output? Well, this is the try to get the output. Let's go ahead and see what it's complaining about. Let's make sure I have the import here as well. So this is gonna be the import of try that we wanna bring in, right? So that those three things we want to import here as well on the Scala side. So that's gonna give us a success because it's a valid airport code, isn't it? So if you look at the output, notice it's a success San Antonio International. On the other hand, if I were to go back here and say, this is a TAS rather than SAT, well, that's a failure. So the response should tell you it's a failure as well. So you can see from the output, it's gonna be a failure object from the try. So the try elevates itself to either a success or a failure. Well, that's a good news so far, but where does this take us from here on? Well, that's great, but what if this were to fail? You could do a try on that, and you can ask it to give us the uh, try to get airport for the code. Well, that's a first step. But now notice the result of this stage is no longer your airport name, it's a try. Well, can I call to uppercase on try? The answer is no, because the concept of uppercase doesn't make any sense on a try, so you cannot do that. So now what you need to do is to perform one more step in here, isn't it? So you're gonna say map, and the map says, take whatever is given to you, which is a try, and map the try. And the, the tr map of try says, if it's a success, apply the function. If it's a failure, 
quietly forward it. Don't do anything with it. So the map is a pretty smart function. Map says, if I have a valid data, transform it. If I don't have a valid data, simply move the error forward with a type change, if you will. So not too bad, isn't it? Well, anytime you hear the word not too bad is a different way of saying Stockholm Syndrome, right? It's okay, they keep me give, giving me food, they keep me happy, they let me sleep, it's all right. So it's really not bad yet. So essentially we went through that phase. So we got the two uppercase. Now what's gonna happen? We wanna print the data. But I can't print the try because I need the data or the error from the try. So what am I gonna do? One more level of work to be done here. So what you're gonna do is you're saying, do a map again, and this time let's do a match. If the value is a success, extract the name. If the value is a failure, extract the error. So we are asking it to give us the error or the data from the call like so. And then you say, I wanna print it out. So in this particular case, we are again going through each of the values, and if it's a success, we can print the name of the airport. If it's a failure, we wanna put the error message. So good news and bad news. So what is first of all the good news? The first good news here, the good news here is that if our data has an error, we are able to deal with it by using this mechanism. So we look at the output, we have the airport code, the error, and the airport name as well, so that's great. The next good news says the code behaves exactly like the way it behaved in the imperative style as well. So that's definitely to be celebrated. But what are the consequences of writing this code? Any, any, what are your thoughts? Thank you. That's the first problem, right? It's very confusing. You lost the clarity you had in functional style. That's the first problem. That's why I call it Stockholm Syndrome, right? It's like, it's okay, people say. You lost the clarity, first of all. Second, so beautiful thought, right? So lost clarity. Second, lost cohesion fails uh, on cohesion at every single level. Why is it la lack of cohesion? Because when you look at a code, you notice what's happening in this case. Oops, uh, let me try this again. Lacks cohesion. Every single line now deals with data and error back and forth. So as a result, you're going back and forth, you have to deal with it. So your entire pipeline so to say is corrupted, right? Because at every stage, you have to deal with data and error, data and error. And everything I wanna do with the data, I gotta constantly map it and map it again. And this is about map, what about filter, right? So you write a filter, and now you have to say, if it's a data, then filter it. If it's an error, pass it through. Your filter becomes smelly. Your map becomes smelly. Every method on the pipeline becomes smelly. Well, when you're done with it now, you can say imperative style is, has more accidental complexity, functional style is beautiful, but the minute you bring exceptions into the picture, that is no longer the case because it's not elegant, it's not easy, it's not clear, it's not uh, you know, following the cohesion at every level, you have much less benefit at this point. So even though this is a solution a lot of people use, I am not a fan of this at all because I want to go in for the benefits it provides. When the benefits come down, I have to ask the question, is this still the right approach to use? And to me, one of the things I'm very careful about is not to become biased, even without knowing. I, I, I have good friends and they would tell me, Function is the only way to write code, and we should never write code in another way. We still eat together, we have lunch and dinner together. We just decided not to talk about this topic, right? Because I completely disagree. So to me, these are tools. 
And if I become biased about a tool, then the failure is on me, right? Because I lose the benefits. So if, if I find that functional style is absolutely beautiful and a better solution, I wanna use it. But if it is not, I, I don't have to be ashamed to switch back to imperative style because that serves the problem better. So my recommendation is, if you're doing functional programming, do so because you have pure functions. Do so because you don't have to deal with exceptions. But if you have to deal with exceptions, if you have to deal with uh, you know, impurity, consider going back to imperative style. I don't think that's a bad idea that we should completely avoid it. And, and to me, it's really deciding which tool is better under what situation. And to me, it's a beautiful tool as long as we are playing within these limits. And the minute we go away from those limits, we need to reconsider what we do. Please. So, one of the very famous methods that I saw the study for in the UK was accepting hundred percent of the data. Yes, it's smelly. But why was it so smelly? Oh, no, it's beyond smelly, isn't it? It didn't work. And it is smelly. That is called hope. That's a beautiful desire to have, right? Because we are saying, maybe it'll still work. But I showed you how it's blowing the pipeline. Once it blows the pipeline, there's no way to process the remaining elements in the pipeline. There's no way to know, and in parallel, you don't even know which is blowing up, right? So the problem is beyond smell. If it's smelly, you can refactor it and deodorize it. But, and, and that's what I was showing earlier, is you can deorderize it by writing those functions, but that's not going, that's only kicking the can down the street because it doesn't smell as bad, but it still doesn't work. And, and you can make it work in a special situation for a particular problem, but it's not a generalized solution. And we keep then, you know, checking these, we catch the exceptions, then people do a logging or they write to somewhere else, and then when you look back at the solution, it's completely kludgy. And then what did we gain? What we gained was somebody said, I gotta write functional style code. So I wanna keep my eyes on the problem I'm solving, not on the method, right? And, 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 and very regularly I question this to myself. I look at this and say, is this the right solution? If it's not the right solution, I need to back away from it because it's not going to be sustainable in the long run when we bring that solution. That, that's what we need to be careful about, right? It's, it's beyond uh, the smell itself that we need to worry about. So, what, what other answers do we have? Is there a better way to do this at all? So, switching gears a little bit, we have the completable futures in Java, and this really is a concept from JavaScript called promises. Now, there is a, pattern called the railway model or a railway track model, essentially what they do in completable future is, as you go through the pipeline, you can either throw an exception or you can return a result. But the way they do this is a bit interesting. So if you think about the railway track pattern, what they actually do is you have a completable future or a promise, but what you really have is a pipeline and, and this pipeline contains a happy path, and it also has a unhappy path. So essentially, you take the data and you send it to a function, and, and now you take the result of that, which is a data, and you send it to a function. And you keep repeating this in this particular pipeline. But the way this is modeled is that if you were to take a data and everything went well, you get a success, and you can propagate that success to the next function, which will then return a success. But if something were to go wrong, it would give you an error. And the next function may try to recover from it. If it's able to recover, you get a data. If it is not able to recover, you get an error. So in other words, you keep moving through this pipeline from exceptions to data handling to exceptions and back and forth. Well, good news is 
they give you these two separate tracks to handle it. But the bad news is it adds to your confusion even more. Because when you look at this code, you have all these, you know, then and catch and then and catch as a pipeline, and it's incredibly hard to keep track of what is happening at what. Cognitive load increases enormously, and you lost the benefit of the functional style. So even though this looks like a great idea, it doesn't really survive a whole lot. In fact, this is exactly the reason why Java script folks introduced promises, but within a few years, they introduced async and await. Here's the beautiful observation. I know it's hard to say JavaScript did things correctly, right? But we got to give credit where it's due. So promises, prom promises really, promises are really functional style uh, with exception propagation. But this is unfortunately very confusing and, and can have a lot of cognitive load. So what did they do? They created async and await, which is really interesting because uh, functions uh, still return promises. So they wrap this around the concept of promises. Your functions can do async and await, but guess what? This is imperative style uh, with multiple levels of exception handling. So essentially, the JavaScript folks said, you know what, this functional style programming idea is great, We've had it for a long time, but in this particular area, we really have to rethink about what we do, and maybe imperative style is better. So most people programming JavaScript today use async and await for asynchronous call rather than doing the functional uh, promises a way of writing code, mainly because it is really a lot easier to deal with exception in the imperative style. Completable future in Java is exactly the promises of JavaScript. So as you can see, we took their bad idea and we are staying with it. And this is not going to help us in the long run. So I'm going to put my money down. In five years, we'll quit using completable futures because that's the worst way of writing, dealing with asynchronous and exception handling with Project Loom I think completable futures will die eventually. And, and so that's really not an exciting idea in general, even though it's conceptually interesting, it leads to that particular problem. So rather unpleasant when it comes to dealing with this entirely. So that finally brings us to the reactive way of doing things. How is that different? In reactive programming, they take a slightly different approach, and that is, when you look at a reactive pipeline, so when you start with a flowable, for example, so when you start with a, re a flowable or a reactive pipeline, what you do with this is you have essentially, uh, so you have data that flows through, but in the flowable you have three channels of uh, communication. So essentially in this case, you have a data channel uh, and through which of course data flows, you have an error channel through which error flows, and you have a complete channel through which a complete signal uh, flows. So you have these three channels of communication in uh, reactive programming. But the way they do this is that as long as everything is going well, data flows through the data channel. But the minute something goes wrong, you get an error through the error channel, but your data channel closes up. You don't get any more data from the data channel. So the benefit of this approach is when you create a flowable and you do a dot, let's say a filter, and you do a map, for example, you have a subscribe in the end, but in the subscribe, you have a first lambda for the data, you have a second lambda, which is for the error, and so this is for the error handling, and then you have a complete channel, which is the complete signal, that you get right here. So this is obviously the data that you're gonna be processing in here, and this is the error, and this is the complete signal. So in this particular case, if anything were to go wrong anywhere in the pipeline, you are not gonna continue with the processing, you immediately jump to the error channel, and it reports the error for you. Again, these are trade-offs. What's the good news? The good news is 
the code is very cohesive. You only focus on data handling through the pipeline. So you don't have a confusing set of code that's trying to tear apart the data and the error. The bad news though, is if something goes wrong, you get directly to the end. It doesn't give you an opportunity to go back and process the data. So if you have some errors, it says, I'm done. I'm gonna report the error, it's a showstopper. If that's what you want, that's great, you got it. But if you want to continue processing other data, you cannot do that. Well, if you want to do it, you're gonna get back to the same mess we talked about, where now you gotta tear apart data and error through the pipeline. So in summary, there is no good answer. But I think the problem really is not with functional programming. The problem is we collectively as humans have no clue how to handle exceptions. And I think that's a bigger problem to revisit. And, and we need to really rethink about how do we really handle errors? And in the past about 25 years, we have become very quiet and complacent, saying exceptions are awesome when they are not. In fact, the first problem I think is calling them exception. They should have called them normal. We would think about them very differently, right? So uh, we claim as exception, and then we get excited when that happens, and then we throw things around. So fundamentally, I think we took a detour in how we do this back in the days of C++, when we started doing exception handling, Java and C Sharp pretty much followed what C++ did, but I think for about 30 years now, we've been doing it wrong. I don't have an answer for you, but I at least can complain about it, right? I, I, rather than saying this is great, I feel like it's not a great solution yet. So the short answer is, it's still out there. This is a great research topic, it's something to investigate, maybe rethink about how we should really deal with exceptions, but from the functional programming point of view, we simply don't have a way to deal with it. Functional programming is definitely awesome, no doubt about it, as long as your operations are pure. Exceptions are not pure operations. Exceptions are impurity, and so we need to really rethink about how we handle them, and, and as of now, I think imperative style programming is a better way to do it. Uh, with Project Loom, which is, which is introducing uh, Java 19, this is only going to become more exciting because when you're dealing with virtual threads, you're going to handle exceptions from virtual threads. That's going to be an imperative style of solution. Project Loom is taking us away from functional style of programming for a really good reason because when you do asynchronous programming, when you do I.O., it's full of exceptions. So Project Loom is telling us well, functional programming is great, so in a way, Java was here in the imperative style camp, Java 8 pushed us towards this direction, and the pendulum is swinging this way, but it's a pendulum, and Java 19 says, hang on a second, maybe that's not the right place to be, let's draw a middle ground. So with Java 19 and, and further, you have to really go even further into mixing functional and imperative style, Project Loom really pushes more towards imperative style of programming for asynchronous uh, applications, and I think that's the right solution for, for that problem with what we know so far, and the, and the functional style is, is great, but I think it's great for when the functions are pure, not when we have uh, you know, exceptions and impure operations. Hope that was useful. Questions, comments, thoughts, anything? Please. everything is success, it looks really, really clean. It's only if you wish to handle an error, you can suddenly get into the match. Yeah, and the, and the if part is when we start losing, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and the, Yeah, and, and, but, but I would say it's the unfair the other way around, right? Because we tend to push the solution, but at some point we have to recognize maybe it's worth reconsidering it. Oh, I'm 100% on that. I mean, one thing that's always bugged me over the years is you know, in the 80s when Object Oriented came back, everybody's like, everything is Object Oriented. You're right. <laughs> and it's, pure, it's all Object Oriented. It's not Object Oriented, it's, it's nothing. And then now we're seeing exactly the same thing on the functional side. Bingo. Now, yeah. like some things, 
compared to what some things with functionally. Yep. Um, like I always hated math, math done functionally, even though it sounds right, but you know, plus is not an operation on one. Plus is an operation that happens to be on numbers, but it's kind of independent. Like a spin more function, not a not a method on an object, I guess that's right. Okay, I, I, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, there's not a method of calculation, so, so right. There's things which fit well, like you, you need to pick your model for what it is you're trying to do. And, and be willing to mix it as well, I think. Uh, and, and I think both sides are dangerous, where somebody says, that's the way I've done it before, I'm going to stick to it, is a problem. Uh, but also to say, here's a different way of doing it, and that's the only way to do it. Uh, in, in fact, what, what's really funny is, uh, to go back to your, your argument, is when people are pitching functional to object-oriented, I think that completely misses the point, because functional is not a competition to object-oriented in the first place. There are a good places where they actually live together. Uh, language like Scala, Kotlin, JavaScript, you can keep going, Ruby, Python. All of them have shown that they actually can coexist. In fact, we have more hybrid languages today than pure languages after all. So, so absolutely, the willingness to mix and match, I think, is, is, is very critical. And, and the willingness to, uh, even, even willingness to prototype and try and say, let's see which one plays better in this particular case and choose rather than trying to force fit something into one or the other, I, I think is, is absolutely important. Other thoughts, comments? Oh, please, please, yes. I think it comes down to using the right tool for the job. Don't be dogmatic about it. If the only tool you have is a hammer, <laughs> every problem looks like a nail. Yeah, and, and somebody said it's even more dangerous when the fly's on a uh, you know, friend's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, yeah. Yeah, please. Good question. The, the Scala example that you showed, is there is there like a JDP or something to have a like in Java? No. Yeah, not to my knowledge. So Weber already has that as a library. Uh, I, I, I don't know of any efforts to bring that into the JDK. I, I'm not aware of that. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's a fairly a thin layer, if you will. So it's a question of three, you know, one interface and two classes. So it's not hard to write one for ourselves if we need to. Um, it would be nice so we don't have to repeat it if it's in part of the JDK. But that's an initiative, maybe a good idea to suggest that and, and see if there's attraction towards it. Yeah. Uh, so sort of related to like the future of in the gallery, uh, I'm not saying this is like the answer or a great answer, but uh, in like the programming language theory world, there's this like thing called algebraic events. So I'm wondering if you've heard of them. Uh, algebraic events? Effects. Tell me a bit more about it. Okay, so I maybe understand like five percent of it, so I'm not gonna have like a great explanation, but the way I understand it is think of like a more generic exception handler. You have effects and then you have handlers that are registered to those effects. And so in a sense it's kinda like uh, these effects can be anything, but they could be like throw an error or it could be like you have a custom effect that uh, might request data from a server or something. And then you have a handler that separately like will handle that effect and it will do whatever, right? Sure. And so the beauty of it is you could like swap out the handlers for whatever effect. And so you can just wrap your code with like, here's the handler, or whatever effects get thrown at whatever level deep into your code, you have a handler that'll just handle it. And so the with Algebraic effects. Another nice thing is that you can resume, for example. So, in the pipeline example, if you had handlers that could like handle certain exceptions or whatever, handle certain errors, then you could just throw. Then you have a handler that would handle it in some way, and then you just come right back and complete the rest of the pipeline. So, so essentially, what what you're describing is another way to think about it is you're you're saying, hey, what if exceptions are just aspects? Right, 
So you can throw aspects into your code, and that's basically what aspects do, is they can you know, weave into your code at any point, and, and so they can just appear in there and say, hey, there's an exception here, I'm gonna handle that particular you know, effect as an, effects basically are another name of form of aspects. So you can say, well, if something happens here, I'm gonna handle it over here. What I think would be really interesting is uh, to really create a few different prototypes of it and see how they really handle practical situations. Um, and, and that might be uh, you know, some pathway to show how that can be done. Uh, the, the challenge is to make sure those can be mapped to the type of processing we do in terms of asynchronous com computations and multiple levels of exceptions where when one exception happens, you want to do, deal with more uh, you know, uh, uh, exception calls, but oftentimes we pull in data from a lexical scope as well when we do this. So, so that's where I think we need to really go back and ask the question, how do these effects pull the data that might be in one particular context? Maybe they pull the data using, I don't know, maybe continuations or so. So it's very well worth uh, seeing how those are implemented in languages and then see how they may fit into mainstream languages. So inter interesting concept. So, definitely. so there's definitely like experimental languages out now that are trying to implement algebraic effects. Um, something, let's see. I think one example is literally called F, like EFF. Uh, Multi-core old camel. And I think there's some stuff in Haskell. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's like a very, so maybe there's hope. <laughs> awesome. Thank, thanks for sharing that. Other thoughts? Please. So if you stick with the uh, reactive string uh, way of programming, uh, you can still do the functional stack even though you're handling the exception. Uh, assuming you are okay with uh, uh, termination on first failure. So it's not an equivalent to the imperative style model though, right? So first of all, the reactive API is really meant for streaming of data. So, so when you're dealing with the stream of data, if a failure happens, you are saying, I don't care to process any more data that may come in the stream. Uh, if we are bought into that, then the answer is that works great. But if you're not bought into it and we say, no, I want to handle the exception for this one, but I want to continue processing other pieces of data after that, then it doesn't fit into it. And if you try to fit into it, you fall back on the same problems as the, what we discussed uh, you know, earlier. But the, your code of handling the data and error all remains functional. So that way you will retain the purity of the so we got to be careful with these things, right? It's kind of like saying, hey, doc, remove the bullet. And the doc says, done. What about the patient? Oh, sorry. We didn't realize you want to save the patient. You want the bullet out. So we can't just focus on purity of functions and walk away, right? So at the end of the day, what is your business? What do you want to achieve with your code? That's the first thing we want to solve. Then comes the elegance and the purity and the you know, way to handle the code. So that's why I want to say, if that meets your business, right? That's why I keep saying that. Because the, if it doesn't meet the business, who cares? It's a beautiful code, it's a better code, it follows better design principles, because a customer doesn't care how we wrote the code, because it has to solve their problem. So, so that's why it's important to ask the question, does it solve my problem? So if what they do fits your uh, problem, you gotta win. But if what they do doesn't fit your you know, solution you're trying to provide, then it doesn't matter that it's better, right? So that's why it's always about pros and cons. It's, it's, uh, that's why I, I avoid this desire to say, I've got an answer, because oftentimes we don't. And if we try to settle on an answer when we don't, we end up with the wrong answer. And then at some point, we forget that we compromised into it. This is why I, I don't like the word best practices. Because best practice means, don't make me think, I'm gonna sign off and, and check mark and keep going, and then we look at this and say, gosh, it doesn't solve our problem, why? Well, we've gone too, too, you know, too much into it. So, so that's why I always wanna evaluate, always want to question it. Is this a right solution? Is this an elegant solution? Uh, and, and if we don't, 
then we end up actually using the wrong solution. Uh, and at some point, we forget to question it. Uh, and when we don't question it, that becomes a standard, right? And imagine, you know, we are in an organization where that's been drilled down through architects and teams. Now we don't even have the ability to challenge that at some point. And now we are like, this is the standard practice, this is how you handle it, and we are stuck in it. So that's why it's important to really evaluate that and say, does it really solve my problem? Is that the right solution? Because, I, I mean, seriously, I work with clients and I would question them, why are you doing it? And in all honesty, the answer I've gotten from them is, because we want to follow good design principles. I would say, but why? Why do you want to follow good design principles? And they would look at me like, are you, you know, kidding? We got to follow good design principles. I'm like, but why? And what, why are you following these principles without knowing you're getting the benefit out of it, right? So I'm always suspicious about solutions. I want to know that they are done for the right reason, not for, you know, reasons that have been told as right. So, so that, that's why I, I would challenge that and ask the question. I'm not saying don't use it. I'm just asking first to evaluate, does it solve my business problem? And if I say I want the same solution as my imperative solution does, then it doesn't. So wouldn't it be a best practice to always question if it's the right thing to do? It is a, it is a good practice. <laughs> it's a good practice. There are times when my wife says something, I don't challenge her. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm wise because I've been married for three decades now, so I've learned my lessons. So that's why it's a good practice. And I do challenge her, but when it's the right moment. Best practice would be challenge all the time and be punished. <laughs> same thing with my children, I, I tell them the same thing, right? So there are times when we do want to challenge, it's a good thing. But uh, I, I have this philosophy, it's not what you say, but it's also how you say it. That makes a big difference as well. So a lot of times, it's, it's important to bring those topics into discussion, and uh, we begin to realize maybe there's an alternative, but a lot of times, we get tangled up in emotions, and we don't uh, see that uh, alternatives at that point. Oh, thank you, thank you.